imagine a world where patients don't have to die while waiting to receive an organ. Imagine a world where organ transplants or organ lists are not a thing anymore. On average, people have to wait somewhere between three to five years to receive a kidney, a vital organ that could mean life or death. And many people don't have time to wait for that. In fact, every single hour of the day, one patient dies while waiting. Why does the life have to depend on the end of another life? Imagine also a world where animals don't have to be used for the development of cosmetic products or pharmaceutical products. I mean, imagine if we can just test our drugs on humans without using humans. Because in fact, animals have been proven not to be an ideal model when developing a product. And in 2013, the European Union, they succeeded to ban the use of animals for the development of cosmetics, which is a tremendous success for the animals. But it's also a challenge for us humans because we have to develop better models to predict how our products will perform. To understand the world that we're trying to imagine, we have to go back to the beginning. And it all started with, uh, actually started at Clemson University with Professor Thomas Boland about 15 years ago. Professor Thomas Boland had a crazy idea, right? His idea was that you can print human cells. He imagined that in the future, we'll be able to print out organs using a, a printer and then be able to implant them. Organs such as cartilage or kidneys or livers or even hearts. And that crazy idea led him to the fact of experimenting with it. And what Thomas did was that he took a regular paper printer, as the one you can see in this high-quality picture, and he took the cartridge, which is, uh, which is essentially what keeps the ink, and he threw out that ink, that expensive ink that, that everybody has to buy every Every, every week. And, and then he put human cells inside of that cartridge. Because what he realized was that the whole of the cartridge, at the bottom of the cartridge, is about the same size as a human cell. So a theory should work. And then he went to, to Word or another text editing software, and he typed his initials. And then he pressed print. And then he printed it out. And it actually worked. The results were astonishing. And he managed to print out his initials using human cells. That was about 15 years ago. And, the, and where we are today is essentially we're working with a technology now called 3D bioprinting. And it's based on the invention of Thomas Boland. And what you need to be able to print these organs, and we're going to do a crash course on how to get this to work. But what you need is first, of course, the human cells. The human cells are the most important building blocks. They're the building blocks of our bodies and all our tissues and all our functions. And the next thing you need is, of course, a printer. As you saw in the picture, Professor Boland was using a, a, a relatively complex printer and, and quite old. Next thing you need is an ink. And ink is a material, and, and in our world, or in the bioprinting world, the ink is, is a biomaterial which is biocompatible, which means that the cells will live in it, they will thrive, and they will do what they're supposed to. Because if you place human cells in an environment in which they like, in which they're used to, kind of like in the body, these cells will start produce things that we expect them to. And the next thing you do is that you start printing. 
And, and in this example, we're printing a, well, you guys will see soon, but it's a structure that starts to build from the bottom up. And it's sped up, and you see the nozzle and the printer is moving in different direction. It's placing these cells in this material exactly where it's supposed to be. And what we ended up with is a human ear. And in this ear, you can have cartilage cells, which are then, they're called chondrocytes, and they will live in there and they will start producing human cartilage. Or another thing that people are printing or researchers are working with is, for instance, blood vessels. The applications for this is tremendous because we can start printing blood vessels that will eventually go into patients and repair damaged tissue. Or perhaps not just blood vessels, but printing functional heart tissue. And the beauty of this, of course, is that it works. And these heart cells, they're beating. And you can start to study and learn what these heart cells and what this heart tissue will do when you test drugs on it. So instead of using an animal, you can use this heart tissue. You can put on, for instance, adrenaline or something that will excite these cells or other medication. But not only can we print healthy tissue, we can also print diseased tissue. So, for instance, we can take cells from a cancer patient. We can multiply them, and then we can print out thousands of cancer tumors. And these tumors, then we can use them to test different drugs and realize and figure out which drug works not only on that tumor or in that specific cancer, but on that patient's cancer tissue. And that's going into a whole new world, which is called patient-specific medicine. And it's quite exciting because when we print these tumor cells, we can understand exactly what they're doing. And you can see they're, they're super chaotic. They're very different from the heart cells. They're, they're behaving in, a, in an irrational way. And that's, that's very common of cancer. That's what we want to see. And then we want to kill it. What's been the challenge, though, with this industry for so many years, ever since Professor Thomas Bolin started, is that it was so expensive to get started with. I have a picture of one of the first computers. Because this is an example of how technology has gone from a very early stage of where it's really challenging to work with. I mean, imagine working with this computer. It must be so hard. There, there are cables and buttons everywhere. But that's also representative of how technology is in the beginning. And bioprinting is none the different. It's the same. The printers, they used to cost, used to cost up to half a million dollars. It used to be huge. A bunch of tubes and buttons. And, you know, you learn it, and then all of a sudden you move on to another, another job or another research position. So nobody will be using that printer anymore. So to change, this, to change the world of medicine and really make an impact and bring this technology to its fruition, we realized that we had to make a change, and it had to be disrupted. And that's the beauty of technology and the movement of, of how things are developed. So we just developed the most cost-effective 3D bioprinter in the world. And then we said, we're going to offer it to everybody. Because we knew that the next treatment for cancer or the next revolutionary medical implant could come from anywhere in the world. Not everyone can afford a bioprinter for half a million dollars. But I can, I can guarantee you that most of them can afford it for around $5,000. So the beauty of it is, to bring this technology to the masses and to really democratize it, we managed to drop the price. And of course, managed to drop the cost of making it. And we did that by just looking at other industries and looking at how 3D printing has developed. Things are getting cheaper. Instead of using very, very complex motors that these half a million dollar machines were using, we used a regular stepper motor that would cost $10. We used belts instead of very complex rails. 
and everything is beautifully made here in Gothenburg. Because we realize that having production close to where we are will help us save time and money. So we started getting these systems out everywhere in the world. And now, about three years later, being in more than 50 countries, we've started to realize what the users are doing with it. And really started to realize that these scientists that are getting these systems and they're starting to bioprint, that it's really taken off. And we realized that up until the point till we started at about 2015, it was slow. And this is a pretty good indicator, the publications. The publication is something that scientists or researchers do when they've developed something new, something innovative. Then they publish their work. And these publications and the growth of the publication is an indication that the access to new technologies has enabled growth and innovation of new things in this field. And I'm super excited about the amazing things that these people and these researchers are doing. And just some of the things that they're doing, we're going to look at them. And For instance, this. This is scientists at Newcastle University, not too far away from here, that have been printing human corneas. There's a need for about, about 5 million patients around the world are in the need of corneas today. And these two researchers, they've been working on this for about two years, and they published this article earlier, or actually later last year, about this work that they're getting close to functional solution. Or how about these researchers that have been working on printing skin? And if you guys remember from the beginning, the skin is a major challenge because we're testing, or we have been testing our, our cosmetic products and our drugs on animals. But all of a sudden, we can start testing it on this printed skin. And this is a beautiful innovation because it's, it's, really, it's really showing and indicating how this technology can be put to good use. Or why not creating multiple different tissues, such as skin or skeletal muscles or blood vessels or even hearts? The beauty of this is that there's so many researchers out there working together to solve this problem. And we are part of that solution. And it's very, very exciting. But the true secret, the true secret to the success of this disruption and how we managed to change the world of bioprinting to start with, comes from being available to everybody working with this. Making it accessible, making it cost-effective, but going out there, teaching people and teaching researchers how it's done, showing them. And only by really building a community can we change the world together. I see a world where these medical challenges and these medical issues won't be as big of a problem anymore. And I see how we together can resolve it. I also see how many of these researchers are doing beautiful work and how their work, together with us, can bring us forward to that potential world. Because remember, their science of today is the technology of tomorrow. Thank you.